these things these these are not consistent with this whole model they're just part this sort of this is a document saying here's what we'd like to accomplish in the short term if we could free education for all children in public schools combination of education with industrial production I like that one etc 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 and um, those are his two etc so is that mine and he just stops there. But the combination of education with industrial production, I think, is interesting because you think of the requirements in, this, in the communist systems to go to, go to training schools in Marxism, in the factory. Normally, there's a quite obscure that I might tell you about, and that is that he was actually in favor of private education. And uh, he, he, he showed in the various studies that the best educated children were the ones that were the factory laborers. And, and this, I think, is where it links to that he was against government schooling in favor of factory says, schooling. What is he saying in public schools? In other words, um, uh, less regimented. Public schools public in, public in, public public in private. Public and private. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. See, in American English, I missed that. Yeah, that means private. It's one of the great, great for all children. The anomalies of Marx is, is, is that he was for private education. That's public schools as private as the government schools. Yeah, as opposed to government schools. Oh, interesting. Well, that's just recognizing a fact. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Are yes. these ten points the total of it? Yeah. Just no, those are all ten. So just, and then there's little paragraphs before and after that line above about taking over, centralizing all instruments of production is in the paragraph above. But they just listed ten points near the end of the Communist Manifesto. So is that virtually the heart of the, of the manifesto? No, that's that the heart. That's sort of the platform at the end. The heart of the manifesto is a sweeping outline of, of, of the class struggles and everything else. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a summary document of the whole world view, you know, setting the stage. And this sort of comes at the end. And I, I, yeah, it's there, but it doesn't really fall out of the model, the earlier model. It's, 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 it's an anomaly, really. It's very confusing, these, these ten points, because if they occur, it achieves precisely what he's always fighting, and that is Trying to down the right. Yeah, this is this is a problem I have. This reform versus whatever. Unless you're smart enough to realize that the state banking centralized, creating a monopoly bank will cause massive instability, as the Austrians say, and that'll bring about the revolution. I don't know, but I don't think he's that clever. James. Yeah, just wanted to mention that the Austrian government, I think, is competing the socialism that is coming at the moment. Nothing to mention. I just hope they won't fight them when the other socialism comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, was Marx at all nationalistic? No, he wants to abolish nations. So he wants all the borders abolished. Yeah, we'll get to that. He argues that uh, if Russia can't resist enough fleet for its own you know, fleet of people, then the central government of the world, of the whole communist world, will uh, take it from Ukraine. Fleets to be transported thousands of miles across half the world to Russia and will all be done without any kind of monetary exchange. Right. When you get down to examining what I've studied, you'll get a few other ones. Okay. In the 1850 Address of the Communist League, Marx presents some ideas on pro proletarian participation during a period of democratic revolution. He's into the fact that there's also people fighting for democracy against dictatorships, and how can Marxists get on the bandwagon? And I, actually, I just, this is the first time I ran into this stuff, was just reading it for here, and it gave me the chills because he was talking about how to co-opt a democratic movement and push it towards communism, and I thought of Nicaragua and, the, and what had happened with the Sandinista movement, and it's quite incredible. And what happened in Russia with the democratic movement, how the communist the Bolsheviks pulled in. This is directly from Marx. He says, the arming of the whole proletariat with rifles, muskets, cannon, and munitions must be put through at once. The workers must attempt to organize themselves independently as a proletarian guard and with a general staff of their own choosing, and to put themselves at the command of the revolutionary community councils, which the workers will have managed to get adopted. While workers are employed at the, at the expense of the state, they must see that they are armed and organized in separate corps with commanders of their own choosing or as part of the proletarian guard. 
Arms and ammunition must not be surrendered on any pretext. Any attempt at disarming must be frustrated if necessar necessary by force. Destruction of the influence of the bourgeois Democrats upon the workers, immediate independent and armed organization of the workers, and an enforcement of conditions as difficult and compromising as possible upon the inevitable momentary rule of bourgeois democracy. In other words, make life miserable when the Democrats come to power. Keep driving them nuts, constant terrorism once the Democrats come in. At the beginning of the movement, of course, the workers cannot yet propose any directly communistic measures. But they can, one, compel the Democrats to interfere in as many spheres as possible the hitherto existing social order, to disturb its regular course, and to concentrate the utmost productive forces, means of transport, factories, railways, etc., in the hands of the state. Two, they must drive the proposals of the Democrats to the extreme and transform them into direct attacks upon private property. Thus, for example, the workers must demand that railways and factories shall simply be confiscated by the state without compensation as being property of the reactionaries. The battle cry must be the revolution in permanence. Which is a strong, strong argument, you know, to, 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 to destabilize the democratic movement and push it towards Marxism. The first um, major uh, Marxist revolution that I didn't mention in the first week, and I, next time I go through this, I will, was in Mexico. And there was the warm-up for the Bolshevik Revolution. And the Mexican party today is called the in Institutionalized Revolutionary Party. It's the revolution has been institutionalized. It's the permanent revolution. And this is... What year was that? 1905, I think it was? 1910. Somewhere in there, right? Just uh, right in that period. All that, that it was sort of the warm-up. Here's a little test one. Okay. Finally, the, my last section on destruction. Right, yes, sir. Democracy is uh, is one man, one vote. Because at that stage, you know, there was nothing nice on that. I just wondered what you would. Oh yes, there were. There were places that had it in the 1860s, in the states, in Britain, and France, and so on. They wanted to have it. It was so talked about. A unitary one man, one vote concept. Yeah, it's a one man, one vote concept. But what he's saying is, that, say they're going to throw over the dictators in um, France. Say there's a French monarch, and they're going to put in a d democratic system of some sort. He's saying, now let's get on that and figure out how we can co-opt that movement and push it towards, right in the case of Lenin, Bolshevism. But no, he's, I think he's, he's in favor of, I, I don't know, I, universal yeah, he's in favor of universal franchise, but that's n not the key. The key to him is to give or change the economic system. And if the political system, he later will advocate, we'll see next week, is a dictatorship, but it's a dictatorship of the, of the labor union consortium, if you will. And so it's a type of democracy in which the masses now have taken control. Of articles that were written by Tom Chapman uh, called In Defense of Democracy. And in this, he shows how they tend to penetrate any organization that is useful. Um, they mean in it, any form of organization. Yeah. Penetrate it, get your people in gradually, mm -hmm. get onto the council, be ready to take over. Oh, yeah, it's quite interesting. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I mean, one of the, the ones worth. Internal politics that Fitz was struggling with right now is that the, there's a very, very, very strong socialist element in the academic staff association. So a few of us are saying, is it worth our while to get in there and sort of tell these guys to shut up? You know, and um, it's one has to, you know, they've got a, an interest in it. They, they're into the power of controlling the university. I'm not into that. But if they control it, then I may not have a job, so who knows? You get into that, you see that. Yeah, but I, it was interesting to see him aware of that type of movement back back in 1850. Okay. I just must say, Marx wasn't in favor of democracy. He saw it as one of the tools. In fact, I, just over here, he wrote an article called Plan of War Against Democracy. It's quite an obscure thing. He, he was anti-democracy, but he accepted that democracy could be used. Well, what okay. was he in favor of if he was against it? He was in favor of communism. Yeah, but you say, if you study communism, it's another form of democracy, although you, you, you believe that it's, it's coming, it's, 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 it's very democratic in its institutions. No, but he was against uh, pr pr Bringing Literally, to the fore people who are communists instead of the others. Against elective democracy. There's debates back and forth. Now, Thomas Hull takes the other position and argues that he was more in favor of democracy. I think the key is that 
he is going is that he wants to change the economic system, and if he can get on the bandwagon of democracy and is to do it, he'll do it. But he's not a great lover of quote bourgeois democracy. He's looking for means to do what he's looking for. Yeah. He's no more in favor of democracy than he is in favor of capitalism. He sees them both as necessary stages towards the communist revolution. In other words, he's an anarchist. Well, he is an anarchist, an essentially. Anarchist. Yeah. Yes, anarchist. Essentially, he wants to smash the state. The state's mm -hmm. gone. So this, you get into uh, one of the real problems that I, I have with Marx is that Marx is, says that the state builds on capitalism, and then we're going to use the state to get to communism, but communism will be getting rid of the state. And that's what we'll talk about that next week, is that whole transition. That's a tough one um, to do. Well, let's just knock this off before you guys all fall asleep on this, and then we'll get to the final depressing stuff, destruction. He, um, I read it, Marx's view of revolution is destruction of capitalist institutions. I've emphasized that in all the lectures. This guy wants to shatter capitalism, and out of capitalism will rise socialism. So he has this idea of progress through destruction. Every revolution is social in as far as it destroys the old society. Every revolution is political in so far as it destroys the old power. Revolution in general, the overthrow of existing power and dissolution of previous relationships is a political act. Socialism cannot be realized without a revolution. You can't vote in socialism. The communists openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social relations. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. Again, he wants to destroy private property. For us, the issue cannot be the alteration of private property, but only its annihilation. By the overthrow of the existing state of society, by the communist revolution, of which more below, and uh, the abolition of private property, which is identical with it, this alien power will be dissolved. Uh, but they, they believe, they, 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 the communists, as I understand them, <coughs> hold that uh, a person's clothes are their private property, for instance. But Marx doesn't. Doesn't he? No. That's gone. It's the people. Okay, early development of the proletariat, he, in the, in this quote here is, he talks about when the proletariat is not formulated well, it's upset with exploitation, it will tend to smash machineries and so on and sabotage it to try and get back to some ideal state. Later on, they'll get organized and they'll get beyond this. But in the early days of the proletariat revolt, he says, with its birth begins its struggle with the bourgeoisie. They direct their attacks against the instruments of production themselves. They destroy imported wares. They smash to pieces machinery. They set factories ablaze. They seek to restore by force the vanished status of the workman of the Middle Ages. And then later Marx will explain that as the revolution, as capitalism evolves, the proletariat will become organized and realize that this doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't smash the machinery. We take it over. Um, but you do destroy law and property. You get rid of that. Law, morality, religion are to him, the worker, so many bourgeois prejudices. The proletarians cannot become masters of the productive forces of society except by abolishing their own previous mode of appropriation, which would mean the wage system. Their mission is to destroy all previous securities for and insurances of individual property. So you get rid of the rule of law, protection of private property. And what you have now today in places like China, as they're moving more towards the market economy, they have to move towards a rule of law. They've got to redevelop legal systems. China, a few years ago, had something like 500 lawyers for the whole country, for a billion people. They didn't have any, they didn't have any law schools. They were gone. They had abolished all laws because it, they abolished all the, all the protection of a property system. He also calls for the destruction of the family, and I tie this in with Pol Pot. There's three quotes there. One is that is the margins are on the bottom two are misplaced. The first one replaced refers to family. Abolition of the family. On what foundation is the present family, the bourgeois family, based on capital and private gain? And he argues that the family is part of the bourgeois system. The proletariat do not have family. And in the communist system, we will get rid of family. Family is a bourgeois institution. He also talks about, I don't have it here, maybe I'll mention it next week, the role of women, that there will be a community <coughs> of women in communism that men can use. And then, um, and then he says that right now they have this institution of marriage. We'll get rid of the institution of marriage, and we'll have a true community of women. You and, uh, think about it the other way down. Yeah. No, he didn't think about it the other way. Right? He just mentions it with women. It's sort of a, <laughs> women will be communal prostitutes. Yeah, that's his view. They will be liberated that way too. Um, so he made it when he said one man, one vote. Yeah, I guess he did. Yeah, <laughs> not one woman. Huh? Um, 
Wage labor will be abolished, labor itself is abolished, the state is destroyed. And now the two quotes above that, I'll just read it the rest. Revolution means destruction of the state and of nationalities. The communists are further reproached with desiring to abolish countries and nationalities. The working men have no country. No respect for borders. No respect for political sovereignty. Instead of the conservative motto of fair day's wages for a fair day's work, they ought to inscribe in their banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wages system. The communist revolution is directed against the preceding mode of activity, does away with labor, and abolish the rule of all classes with the classes itself. So it's abolishing the whole system. The proletarians, if they are to assert themselves as individuals, will have to abolish the very conditions of their existence hitherto, namely labor. So he abolishes labor, which is odd. And thus they find themselves directly opposed to the form in which hitherto the individuals of which society consists have given themselves collective expression, that is, the state. In order, that, therefore, to assert themselves in the, as individuals, they must overthrow the state. So they abolish the labor system, and they abolish <coughs> that institution that gives them some semblance of collectivity to state along with it. There's two, two references where he calls for a reign of terror. And I end with that. The first one in, re in re reference to an 1848 counter-revolution in Vienna, which is a revolution against the Marxists, or if you will, the socialists. And he says, the pointless, pointless massacres since the June and October days, the tedious sacrificial feasts since February and March, the cannibalism of the counter-revolution itself, all these things will convince the people that there is only one way of shortening, simplifying, and concentrating the murderous death pangs of the old society, the bloody birth pangs of the new. Only one way, revolutionary terrorism. Again, when his paper was closed <coughs> down in 1849, the Norianische Zeitung, he wrote, we shall have no compassion, and we ask no compassion from you. When our turn comes, we shall not make excuses for the terror. And he could have had the coming from So it's a it's not a peaceful world that he's proposing at all. In other words, he, he says what he's looking at is that people who have got power cling to it by any means they have. Or almost any means. Yeah. 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 Some of them do. But he's advocating using violence. Because for without ten comes we're gonna clean you up. Yeah. That's what he says. So. so you know when you if if you find a Marxist that doesn't advocate violent revolution, he's sort of a softy. <laughs> It's not the real stuff. The real stuff is violent and, and butcherous. Okay, see you next week for fantasy time. Okay, bye. How is that, Leon? This is very good. Why don't we have this the other way? We get more room. I can't believe I've made it to the fifth of these. I've, I've titled this lecture Fantasy. Hello. I titled this lecture Fantasy, and it's somewhat of a attack. This is going to be a discussion of Marx's view of communism or post-capitalist societies, which I think is a fantasy. So unlike the other four, well, I've somewhat tried to be fair to him. Now I'm going to be a bit unfair and attack the guy, because I think he's wrong when he wants to replace capitalism, to be um, blunt about it. The first part will be about working class consciousness, and I'm going to talk about his idea of collective consciousness, what that is, and then a critique of that. The second part would be w the few things that Marx says about the dictatorship of the proletariat or the post-capitalist system. There's two phases, the transition to communism and communism itself. And then we'll take a break. And the third part is going beyond Marx and developing something called the socialist calculation um, problem. This is a problem of whether or not it's possible to have an economically efficient system without markets, without prices, without money, and so on. It's called the socialist calculation of fates. And so this, is, this follows from what Marx is proposing, abolish capitalism, we're going to have a new system. And this will be sort of a combination of history and theory explaining the problems with that approach. And then finally, I put on this one, last one, a few books. We'll refer to them now. Let me see what page they're on. Um, page 10, the last page. Just some suggested books on critiques or understandings of Marxism. Maybe I'll just find a minute and go through with them. I brought them in tonight, so at the break, if you want to look at them, you can. This is on page 10. The first one is a history of economic thought book by Eklund and Erber called what is it here? 
a history of economic theory and method. There's a lot of, if some of you get into reading about Marx in the context of all of economics, you can pick up a history of economic thought book. This is one, one of the ones that I prefer. It's a better, uh, better treatment of Marx, of Mises, of different people. Uh, so I just brought that in as one example. The second book by Hayek, Collectivist Economic Planning, Critical Studies of the Possibility of Socialism, is a book of articles that he edi edited in 1935 on this whole issue of economic calculation. And this is, this will, actual edition was published in 1935, and so I think I mentioned this earlier, the last time this book was taken out of Witz was in 1969, so it's, <laughs> it's, you can tell that there isn't too much interest in whether socialism works at Witz, they've sort of accepted. <laughs> and um, so it's not a big seller, but it's got included in it one of the articles were mentioned by Mises, so you can take a look at this. There's about three or four copies at Witz in the business economics, with, what do they call it, business education library. Okay, um, what's the name of that? Uh, this is this number two here, Collectivist Economic Planning. The third one is a very modern book by a young professor at uh, George Mason University named Don Lavoy called Rivalry and Central Planning, which takes a modern look at this whole debate. So if you wanted to look at a survey of this whole debate of whether or not socialism works in sort of a heavily academic debate, this would be the book to look at. I also took this out of Witz, and um, I'm the second person to take it on two years, 1985, so again, it's not widely read. Um, the third one is a new book that I have brought from the States called The Main, the fourth one, number four, by Tiva McCann, who's a philosopher at Auburn University now. The Communism versus Capitalism. This is set up as an attempt to have a textbook, and they have a reader by a communist, they have an article by somebody socialist to communist, and an article by a capitalist, so they go back and forth with excerpts from various people on it. So, and it's, it's quite a good little reader. It's a bit heavy, but it's, um, it's a good reader on a lot of the points that we covered in this course by other authors. Okay. The fifth one I put in bold, Socialism and Economic and Sociological Analysis by Ludwig von Mises. This is the book to read if you're interested in the critique of socialism. I wore my Ludwig von Mises tie today to sort of show my true colors here. Uh, Mises is the major critic of, of socialism. This book is the opposite of Das Kapital. Das Kapital is the critique of capitalism. This is the critique of socialism, written in 1922, the first edition. Um, Eustace, can this be ordered through the Free Market Foundation? Is yeah. He, yeah. Well, he disappeared for Cokes, I guess. Um, it can be ordered. Okay. 15 Rand. It's, it's not cheap. Yeah, 15 Rand is. 15 Rand, you can use it as a doorstop if you can't read it. Um, I'll be reading some excerpts from this today, and this is this is a phenomenal work. Can you get the tie with it? No, the tie, I, I had to pay a lot for the silver tie. I um, got this from the, this is from the Mises Institute, which is based in Auburn, Alabama. Um, the, la the next book after that is Human Action, which is Mises' magnum opus, which is a complete explanation of uh, economic theory, free market economic theory, including the critique of Marxism. If you can get through this book, you know economics. This is a phenomenal book. It's, it's, um, and this one, I think, is a lot more money from the 96 Rand, so socialism is a better value. And then finally, a book by Thomas Sowell called Marxism, Philosophy, and Economics. Thomas Sowell is an economist at the, at the uh, Hoover Institute at Stanford, and who used to be a Marxist and is now a free marketeer, somewhat in the position that I'm in, who's written a nice little summary of Marxism. It's a bit more philosophical than the way I presented this course and doesn't deal with the debates that I'm going to give you today. But it's, it's one of the best sort of summaries of Marxism from a non-Marxist scholar who doesn't sort of believe in Marxism. And so if you guess, this is one that I would recommend taking a look at. And I think you can get this in the Free Market Foundation also. It, all, it talks about the well, world, the solution is capitalism and all, and all these critiques and not to go with socialism, but it, it's more of talking about some of the problems he has with his approach to the world. But it's, it's done in, I thought it was readable, but it's done in a rather philosophical approach. So-and-so said this, and so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said that, and so you got to follow through, you know, how scholars like to do that. They just can't say it, they got to say it with 400 footnotes. Um, here's a couple more of these. Let me see. I'm running out slowly here. 
Oh, there's more. Okay. Do you have one? James. Here. Let's go this way. Okay. So as I said, those books you can take a look at. Okay. okay, let's push off and talk a little bit about dictatorship of the proletariat. Oh, one other thing too, right at the end of your handout, I believe, is a an evaluation form that I would appreciate maybe at the break if you could fill out a form that I asked two questions. What did you like about the lecture series and how could the series be improved so I can get a little feedback if um, I a little consumer response. So you can fill that out and give it to myself or to Eustace. At, at the end of the period, I'd appreciate it. Okay, working class consciousness. Marx, and I have here three stages, materialist, proletarian, and communist consciousness. Marx tries to argue for a collective consciousness or a class consciousness that's based on the material mode of production, the way in which we produce and relate determines our consciousness. And from there, then, he'll talk about a specific class consciousness, the proletariat class. According to Marx, the real conditions of life shape human consciousness. We are, we think and feel because of the way we work, the way we produce, how we relate in the production process. He says, quote, the productions of ideas, of conceptions of consciousness is at first directly interwoven with the material activity and the material intercourse of men, the language of real life. We set out from real active men, and on the basis of their real life process, we demonstrate the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of this life process. Life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. Where he says in a preface to the Critique of Political Economy, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. So the way we think, according to Marx, has to do in with the way in which we relate, in, and according to Marx, it is based on the material mode of production. As I say, material relations shape consciousness. It depends, our consciousness depends and social conditions, and consciousness is a collective concept. It's a class concept. Consciousness always arises from the need, the necessity of intercourse with other men. Consciousness is therefore from the beginning a social product and remains so as long as men exist. There's just a couple quotes to make that basis. From here, Marx is going to argue for the development of something that he calls the proletariat consciousness, so the consciousness of the working class, which will be the thought process that leads to revolution. It's the collective thought process that will lead to the overthrow of the capitalist system. The workers, are gonna, we, we've been saying along that there'll be all these economic crises and eventually the workers get mad as hell and they revolt. Well, according to Marx, they've got to have some type of collective madness and they work as often they think together on this. And I say from, from the alienation of the factory relations comes the association of factory laborers. And we've pointed that out, how factories bring about association of laborers. From the exploitation of factory laborers comes the formation of trade unions, which is the engine for revolution. And from the instability of capitalism comes the proletariat revolution. And so it's through this proletariat, as we saw in the last couple lectures, that we have this move towards communism, this co emerging proletariat consciousness, if you will. Quote, in the development of the productive forces, there comes a stage when productive forces and means of intercourse are brought into being, which under the existing relationships only cause mischief and are no longer productive, but destructive forces. And connected with this is a, a class is called forth, which has to bear all the burdens of society without it enjoying its advantages. This class is the proletariat class. The conditions that create the proletariat, the conditions of production, also create the consciousness of the working class. The working class is aware, consciously aware, that they have to sell their labor power in order to live. They're aware of the necessity of exploitation for their own survival. Out of this awareness will then develop the awareness of revolution. Marx says, the consciousness of being solely determined by himself, of being free as well as the feeling of the responsibility which is connected with this, make him a better worker than a slave, because like every seller of goods, he is responsible for the goods which he supplies. 
the free worker is obliged to assure the continuity of his relationship for his existence and that of his family depend on the continual renewal of the sale of his labor power to the capitalist. The worker knows his position. He knows he's being exploited and that he has to do this to maintain his survival. Proletary consciousness, I say, is the consciousness of alienated labor. As capitalism progresses, as trade unions develop, as ex exploitation gets worse, this conscious and this becomes a mass movement, a mass movement towards revolution. The proletarian movement is a self-conscious, independent movement of the me immense majority. And I say then the co collective consciousness of the proletariat generates the revolution. Since the abstraction of humanity is practically complete in the full-grown proletariat, since the conditions of life of the proletariat sum up all the conditions of life of society today and all their inhuman acuity, since man has lost himself in the proletariat, yet at the same time has not only gained theoretical consciousness of that loss, but through urgent, no longer disguisable, absolutely imperative need, that practical expression of necessity is driven directly to revolt against that humanity. He's Marx's view is that the revolution is going to come about by a mass awakening of the, of a mass awareness of the exploitation and the people just throw over the system. As we know, and we'll talk about London later, this doesn't happen. Most modern day, quote, communist revolutions are engineered coups by small groups of people. They are not mass uprisings. I'll mention one that I think is later on. No. He's just talking about necessity then. But, but, Right, they're, they're aware of it, but then they're aware that they have to make a living, but eventually they're going to revolt against this inhuman way in which they have to make a living. They're eventually going to say that this is wrong, and this is what he's been pushing for, that the working class will move towards overthrowing the system as a class, not as individuals, but as a class. And we see that, you know, in reality, that doesn't happen. We have engineered coups, and Lenin comes in on a secret train car to, to um, Petrograd and sets up a a Marxist state. It doesn't come about by the masses revolting. Uh, yeah, it's usually, it's usually the intelligentsia that can get through reading things like Marx and get inspired by the stuff. And we'll see when, um, is it here? Yeah, it's going to be, a, that's the thing that, uh, that's another problem that I have with Marx is, if you were to generate this violent anger on the part of the working class, how would you control it? Mm -hmm. well, uh, the ultimate object is just the violence per se. No, there is the objective beyond that is to bring about the communist system. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. That's, that. that's the problem, one of the problems. Out of eventually, once you overthrow the system, and you start moving towards a communist system, overthrow capitalism and move towards a communist system, eventually a communist consciousness develops. A consciousness of what was once called the working class, but it's now the people, that is able to bring about the communist system. So just as a consciousness of the proletariat will bring about the revolution, a new consciousness will bring about communism, a new collective consciousness. Um, Marx comments that capitalist relations creates, quote, a class which forms the majority of all members of society and from which emanates the communist consciousness. Communist consciousness, I would say, is the consciousness of associated labor as opposed to alienated labor. It's the, the post-capitalist system, the association of men in the some communist system. It arises, in Marx's view, specifically out of the destruction of the capitalist order. The consciousness of associated labor awakens in the revolution over the relations of alienated labor. So the destruction not only destroys capitalism, it's sort of a, a, an, a I don't know what you'd say, a baptism process in which you now get the new spirit once you've destroyed the old system. He says, both the production on a mass scale of this communist consciousness and for the success of the cause itself, the alteration of men on a mass scale is necessary an alteration which can only take place in practical movement, a revolution. This revolution is necessary, therefore, not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only in revolution succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found a new society, found society anew. So the, the destruction of capitalism will create a new way of thinking.
he says. Rather Masonic statement view. Um, the new society will be constructed by one, men and women sharing in a new consciousness of association and destroying the bourgeois institutions of alienation and exchange. They will become conscious of new ways of integrating and coordinating society. Capitalist relations will be replaced by new relations determined by a new consciousness. Okay. That's as far as he goes, and what that looks like we'll see in a second. My here, then, what I want to do is give a bit of a critique of this, because I think this is one of the, to me, a key problem is Marx, is this notion of a working class consciousness. I don't buy it. Um, okay, and from this, you'll see that the quotes in this critique do c come from Mises and mostly from socialism. My point, I'd say, is men and women as social beings are beings within a society. All social evolution takes place within individuals. Individuals make up new words, develop new tastes, and invent new methods of production. Society does not think, society does not act. Individuals think, individuals act. Individuals reason. Social change is a combination of individual changes. That's how I would argue against Marx, that this notion of a collective change is a combination of individual changes. So what do you think? Groupthink is negative. A groupthink is not, doesn't exist. That's what I would say. Well, let me walk through this. And uh, I'll say how it exists, if anything, is through political persuasion. But it doesn't exist from an economic basis, as Marx says. And let me let's see, follow my argument, if it makes some sense. Mises says, the hangman, not the state, executes the criminal. First, which is one of my favorite lines, so I always, always talk about the state. There's somebody who actually pulls the rope or whatever. Somebody actually sh you know, shoots the bullet. It isn't a state. It's people that do it, individuals. For a social collective has no existence in reality outside of the individual member's actions. The life of a collective is lived in the actions of the individuals constituting its body. This is from Ludwig von Mises. I would say there's no such thing as a collective thought. There's no such thing as a collective consciousness. Propertyless workers, the proletariat, face similar wage labor conditions and thus think similarly. Likewise, Bushmen face similar harsh climatic conditions and thus think similarly. However, thinking similarly is not the same as thinking collectively. They're not the same things. So, so, and my argument is that there are many things that influence how we think. And I, just as a way of example, I'd say society is multidimensional. A black mine worker is not just part of the proletariat. He is an employee, say, of Rand Mines. With the right of share ownership, he may even be an owner. He is Koza. He speaks Koza, Zulu, Afrikaans, and English. He's a member of the National Union of Mine Workers and the United Democratic Front. He's a South African. He has brothers and sisters. He's a husband and a father. He's a Methodist. He plays soccer on a company team. He dances with friends. He belongs to a fishing club. He's a complex individual. The fact that he sells his labor for a wage does not solely determine how he thinks or feels. Proletary consciousness based on economic relations is a myth. There are many things that influence how we think and feel, not just how we make our money, that we sell our, our labor for a wage. Says the Mises, the proletarians are not a special group within the framework of modern society whose attitude is unequivocally determined by their class position. Individuals are brought together for the common political action by the socialist ideology. The unity of the proletariat comes not from its class position, and I would say not from its economic position, but from the ideology of class war. So Mises' argument is the proletariat is created as a political movement. It's not an economically based concept. Working class consciousness does not emerge from the conditions of production. In production, there's competition, there's competition on the market, there's competition for promotion. Workers are naturally aligned. They're competing, just like anybody else in the marketplace. Any solidarity workers feel is politically inspired, not economically inspired. So-called working class consciousness is politically nurtured. Marx advocated war between capitalists and workers. In order to do this, he develops a theory of alienation, exploitation, economic crises to motivate workers to politically unite to bring down capitalism. Says Mises, Marx realizes the immense social power that can be achieved by welding out of the great masses of workers herded together in workshops a political factor. And he seeks to find the slogans to unite these masses into a coherent factor. He preaches a doctrine of salvation which rationalizes their resentment and transfig transfigures their envy and desire for revenge into a mission ordained by world history. So we showed, according to Marx, it's inevitable, so it's justifiable. This is what's going to happen, so it's okay to destroy capitalism. 
He inspires them with consciousness of their mission by greeting them as those who carry in themselves the future of the human race. As a master of demagogic technique, Marx was a genius. This cannot be sufficiently emphasized. He found the propitious historical moment for uniting the masses into a single political movement and was himself on the spot to lead this mo movement. So the argument that this working class consciousness is, if anything, is a politically inspired, not an economically inspired concept. And I would argue, take it a step further, and Marx wants to bring about a communist society. Communist consciousness is a fantasy, this idea of a consciousness of associated labor. Violent destruction of capitalist institutions will not change human consciousness, which Marx believes. We destroy capitalism and we'll think differently. It will impoverish the masses. In a ruined society, individuals in need will act spontaneously to satisfy their needs. They will offer their labor, they will produce, they will trade, they will act in their own self-interest. The idea of a collective consciousness spontaneously developing collectivist methods to provide for collective needs is mad, it won't exist. The special community of proletarian interests extends only so far as they pursue one aim, to break up society. And there is nothing in socialism which makes it especially appropriate to forwarding the real interests of the proletarian class. And my argument is after proletarian revolution, the only way to make collectivism occur is by suppression of individual actions. Because if you don't, individuals will act individually. That's who we are. We act individually. Communism cannot be collectively willed. It must be forcefully imposed. It will not be come from the desires, volunteer desires of the masses. It has to be forcefully implemented. Individually well, individually implemented by those, the intelligentsia, who decide that to speak for the masses. And so when I'm, uh, who say that, and what Marx will set up, we'll see here, is he sets up a transition phase, the dictatorship, until the masses are ready to, for communism, until their consciousness has changed. And he talks about that. He's quite explicit that there's a stage. And now how the stage is run is another problem. You know, how do we set up a dictatorship that's just and um, fair and so on. The dictatorship of the proletariat. We'll do that one next. <coughs> yes? Until your consciousness changes, you don't get rid of the dictatorship. It's right, but how do you know when's the signal? Right, that's does, that, does that mean we can associate the genius with the intelligence? No. What this would be argued, what Marx would argue is that the union's intelligentsia, to use a Marxist view, is, uh, modern day Marxist view, is that a intelligentsia group will use m labor unions to get into power. So the labor unions are manipulated by people who want to use this force to gain power. This would be a critique that Lenin used uh, working class movements for his own personal gratification, and Stalin did the same. So that the, the trade unions are being duped by people who say they're really interested in the working class, but they're only interested in their stone self-aggrandizement. That's the argument that's made. Now, some of these may be sincere people that they really believe this will happen. My problem is, once you tear down capitalism, what's the system going to look like? And we'll see that. And I don't think there's a system that can be built that's going to improve the, the welfare of the masses. Mm. So, we'll just walk through this and we'll see what you think. But uh, isn't it the do-gooders that do all the harm? Not all the do-gooders. Some do-gooders do, okay? But, in other words, one can say that some of these people that are ad strongly advocating, say, Marxist revolutions in Africa mean well. Some of them do. I'd say others don't. I, I'm somewhat cynical and think a lot of them see this as a means to power for themselves, individual power. But some mean well. You know. mm. I have colleagues that I know that at, at WITS, they really mean well. They don't mean a brutal dictatorship. They, they'd like a dictatorship that works the way they think it ought to work. You know, so it wouldn't be brutal because they'd be in charge and they're not brutal guys. So you know, they think it'd be a nice one. You know. You know. I agree. I would Im See, and I agree with that. That um, and the, the example, the little paragraph of the black mine worker. What I was trying to do is give an example. Of somebody belongs to many different <coughs> groups, many different communities. He's a, well, that's also Marxist but 
that's part, that's one thing he is. And he's also members of other groups. So in a market economy, it doesn't say that we're all running around as individualists. We're all running around as parts of groups. But it isn't that we're just, according to Marx, the only group that has any relevance in a worker's life is the fact that he's a member of the working class. And other groups are all sort of secondary. And I would argue that that's not true, even for your average man in the streets here in the States or whatever. They belong to bowling teams. They go golfing, whatever. They watch TV together. Maybe you're able to cite here the Euro problems, too. Right. And this is not the most aspect of the Euro problems. And, that's poli and I would argue that they're politically trying to inspire something. It's not coming from the economic basis. It's not something that that a person is naturally saying that this is how I am as a person is by the fact that I crack rock. That isn't, you know, people are more than rock crackers. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough one. When you get down to the situation that many workers get down to, they turn to that. Oh, sure. Sure. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they necessarily turn to it. Is they're, they're pushed toward it also. They have, I mean, the system where everyone is housed in a certain area and moved to this particular spot and put in the same housing. I mean, they're given an exact structure in which they fit into that collective yeah. And so it's not as if they feel better that way, they're actually pushed that way. Well, there are circumstances yeah. to it. But uh, uh, I think it was Marx or, 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 or Venice uh, uh, held out that you can be, be able to be a minority of one and survive. In other yeah. words, you must stick to what you believe, even if the others disagree. Not, in, not, if you're not in a collective movement, you wouldn't. You wouldn't no. be the collective no. movement. No. Well, let me Some, somewhere the capitalists are really feel, you know, um, have exercised a bit of exploitation to the workers. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what about the trade unions? They are coming together. Perhaps they are getting lectures from uh, some uh, socialist intellectuals as well. As they seem to go the line. So what can we do to avoid the threat, the fulfillment much Well, what I, I think that's a big question. What can we do as a, I love this, what can we do as free marketeers and individualists to collectively fight socialism? <laughs> <you know? laughs> and there's some truth to that. And uh, I, I would say that part of what we can do right now is what we this lecture series is all about, is to become aware of what this view is, is and to be able to understand it. And in this five lectures, I'm not coming up with the six lectures that says, now how do we go on and attack them? But one of the things you have to do is to know who you're dealing with. I so should ask Leon to front to Leon. You've been doing this more than I have here. And yeah, I just uh, queried James whether any of Marx's prophecies have come true. As far as I know, all of them not come true. Other than Marx's prophecies, I don't think there's any prophecy that the Marx has come true. And what, what instead you see around the world is now something like 50 countries it's the third part of my talk. Let me let me work as I need to have a little private discussion with you because I think you're giving your workers jobs and wages and all the people who are Marxists aren't doing that. And um well let Let's, let, let's, let me walk through this and see. I will say a similar thing, that, social, that Marxist socialism doesn't exist anywhere in the world. And wh I'm seeing cracks of concerns even among socialists here. The other day I was out with a, um, we were out with a black reporter from the Sowetan who was just totally upset that Tanzania is talking about markets. He said, what are they doing, these people? They've lost the cause. And I said, no, they're getting wise. You know, they're starting to realize that people are going to eat, they need some marks, uh, markets. And, so there's a lot of cracks going on in Marxism. That's where I end up, that the Marxists are starting to get skeptical. And I think the thing is to push that, those cracks more. Right. Would, sorry, would a good argument be that when you submit to collective consciousness, you give up your individual liberty and your individual liberty of thought? Mm -hmm. And I would argue you give that up and you'd also, 
if you look at the evidence of the communist world, you give up collective liberty too. They don't even have democracy. So they talk about somehow the masses are going to make decisions, and that doesn't work either. And we'll see a mention of that with Poland. You know, I say that people are giving up their individualism continually when they join any. Yes, but we voluntarily join lots and lots of little groups. That's different than this idea of this mass movement. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's sort of capitalism, in one way to use the term, is it's an open shop of groups. We can join and go in and out of groups. And it is a system of groups. It's not a system of a bunch of autonomous people. We're all in groups. And, uh, all, all different types. This is a group. Voluntarily joining. Me. What of the relating to Marxist prophecy? What I see is the threat, the communist threat, it outweighs the, I would say, what, what the West, the Western countries, they are. They're actually setting the to, to, to Marxist domination. I see the threat that they're facing of relating to the spread of communism in worldwide. So in those cases, I was thinking it's just on the page of, you know, getting all over the journey. Yeah, but I would argue that those countries aren't com Marxist communists, they're just totalitarian dictatorships. Yeah. And they just use communism as a way to dupe the masses. Yeah that these countries are not communist in the true spirit of a collective association of people that it's totalitarian dictatorships. We'll see that when we get to Lenin. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I was, I was, my view was on the line of the, you know, the international workers' union. Mm -hmm. You know, they are maneuvering as well as the existence of a chief thus far. So, you know, viewing it from that point, it's, it's all over. There is no way. Well, we have to look. It, it varies around the world. Right now, unions are totally a bad word in the States. They're out. Unions are blech. <laughs> and here, they're sort of the hot new in thing. And, you know, South Africa always seems to be about 10 years behind the States in style. Now we have campus riots here. Maybe 15, you know. I was in campus riots in the early 70s, and I come over here and in campus riots in the late 80s. It's sort of fun. And the same thing you... Yeah, that type of thing. I would they agree that the, the prophecy is in there, but you do get, there's a lot of feelings. These feelings of exploitation and alienation are still very appealing. Yeah. I mean, even though you can, one of the, one of the big ones that, the, that people use, and I even even push that one, because I want to hit him on, well, my critique of Marx is not with specifically I'm not critiquing directly his prophecies in capitalism in this lecture, but saying that what he wants to replace it with is just the madness. Um, but one of his prophecies is that the workers are going to get poor and poor and poor, and that's just not true. It's just not true. The masses have gotten wealthier and wealthier and wealthier in the last century. There's just no way you can... But then you can read Marx as I did, and Marx will say, well, they've gotten relatively poor, and then you get into these big arguments on the distribution of wealth. and you know, That's not the key issue. The key issue is I don't think Marx is anything that can beat Capitalism is a system for mass wealth. Yeah. The reason I mentioned that uh, uh, Marx project seems to be obscured now um, is because you know if you look at the threat of the trade unions, you can see that it's just that was the one you put in your letter. Um, I'm not talking about the ten about when we have gone through a terrible revolution. And then we come to our senses and we return to capitalism. I think the damage will have been too great as far as I'm concerned. And that's what I was saying. What can we do to stop it for it We have to think of Look at this, it's like you can't stop it now. The trade union movement here is fascinating to look at, what's going on now. And I don't know. That's one. That's an area that I'm going to be doing research on. It fits, is to follow this and to see what the heck can be done in that. Employ stock ownership programs, work of management programs, participative management programs, these types of things to, to alleviate feelings of alienation and exploitation in the marketplace and the workplace is something that has to be addressed here. Things that Nancy referred to, the hostels and getting away from that type of living environment that pushes that, that type of consciousness. Those are tough. You know? But what can we do? I don't know. We can, that's when are you talk about exploitation, um, there it is, if you really say you are giving the workers employment and salary, you know, what about the hostels, the massive hostels, highly 
lived in one myself. I've never seen a wicked thing like that. I'm lucky I survived. I'm not a social media. Let me push on. Let me let me push on and we'll do the dictatorship. Okay. Dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, the second part here it, that I want to talk about and it's on the fantasy here of Marx is what he proposes for a post capitalist system. Throughout his writing here is very brief references on what I, a post capitalist society, what it looks like. And there's nowhere does he present an extensive analysis of socialism or of communism. As I've said, he writes volumes of critiques of capitalism. We've seen them, they're fascinating critiques. The proposal is to tear the system down, put in socialism. Now, what the heck does socialism look like? He says very little. He never offers a workable model of how this thing is going to work. He does have two phases of socialism, of a post-capitalist society, if you will. Um, one is the transition to communism, and then the second is communism itself. I might say that, it, I didn't put it in the notes here, but I'll say that up until the time of Stalin, the word communism and the word socialism are synonymous. They mean the same thing, and I use them in the lectures the same. I have a hard time distinguishing between the two words. Today, sometimes we'll talk about socialism as an economic system in which the state owns the means of production. Your definition, if you had a little question at Witt's Business Economics, what does socialism students say? Government owns the means of production. And then communism means something more than that, changing consciousness, changing art, changing values, and everything else. Um, if you want to use those words, then socialism is the transition period, the state owning the means of production, and communism comes beyond that. But in Marx's term, the words meant the same thing. There's not a difference. They're, they're like saying free enterprise and capitalism, or free enterprise and free market. They, they're the synonyms. So does socialism, in his terms. Yeah. Today, more so. People will talk about democratic socialism, and things like that. It's, is sort of a softer thing. But in basic Marxist-Leninist writings, the words are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. OK. Marx says, between capitalist and communist society lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of one into the other. Corresponding to this is also a political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. This comes in 1875 from the Critique of the Gotha Program, which is a short little work near the end of his life, which says the most that he ever says is an entire life about communism. It's only a few paragraphs, and that's part of that comes from there. But I, I would trace back, and I was able to find as early as 1850 a reference to the dictatorship of the proletariat 25 years earlier in his analysis of the class struggles in France, which was looking at the French Revolution of 1848. And in that book, he's writing, he says, overthrow the bourgeoisie dictatorship of the working class. This socialism is the declaration of the permanence of the revolution. The permanence of the revolution continues. Permanence of the revolution, the class dictatorship of the proletariat, as a necessary transit point to the abolition of class distinctions generally, to the abolition of all the relations of production on which they rest, i.e. capitalism, to the abolition of all the social relations that correspond to these relations, marriage, church, family, state, so on, to the revolutionizing of the ideas that result from these social relations. Okay, so as early as 1850, he's already thinking of a transition period in some, using the word dictatorship. In 1857, in a letter, he states, what I did that was new to prove, one, that the existence of classes is bound up with particular historical phases in the development of production, two, that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat, Three, that this dictatorship itself only constitutes a transition to the abolition of all classes into a classless society. So those are three references, and I think they might be the only three times he uses dictatorship of the proletariat, as far as I know, in his writings. But it's explicitly those words, but it's quite clear that he's talking about a transition period. I would argue, though, that he doesn't envision a Leninist to Stalinist dictatorship. Marx is not advocating one-man dictatorship. He's picturing a powerful centralized state that's ruled by the representatives of the proletariat, if you will, the trade union party. The trade unions take over the state. So it's not, so it's the masses become the dictator, if you will, or the, the organ of the masses. The communist party in Lenin's term, Lenin sets up another communist party. 
At worst, dictatorship then means, in Marxist term, a one-party democracy, in which the one party represented, represents the broad majority of the people. And you can see this today with Mugabe-style dictatorship of the proletariat going on in Zimbabwe. Mugabe now has the same title as P.W. Bota. They're both state presidents, one-party type democracies, same type of systems. Except Mugabe calls himself a Marxist, and P.W. Bota says he's an anti-Marxist. But they have very similar institutional structures now in the countries. Um, in the transition period, then, you were going to have an authoritarian government that is somehow a one-party state representing the workers that will continue to tear down capitalism and continue to build up socialism. So there's this permanent revolution. Now the state has taken over, and we're going to make the socialist system. What we have to deal with here is a communist society, not as it has developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, which is thus in every respect economically, morally, intellectually still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whom's womb it emerges. So we're going from the capitalist system to the communist system. He only sketches the institutional structures, very little talk of it. We saw some of it last week at the Communist Manifesto points, those planks, the ten planks of these are things we're calling for, some ideas of what he's looking for. In the Critique of the Gotha program, he talks about state labor certificates replacing market wages, which I think it's just semantics, but Marx says, according um, the accordingly, I guess it is, accordingly, the individual receives back from society, after deductions have been made, exactly what he gives it. He receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labor, and with the certificate draws from the social stock of the means of consumption as much as costs the same amount of labor. The same amount of labor which has given, he has given to society in one form, he receives back in another. Hence, equal right here is still in principle bourgeois right. So he's got his transition period is one in which you don't have wages per se, now you have certificates. Well, it sounds like money to me. It's just. No. What he's saying now, what he's saying now is that it's. It's. Um, oof. It's, if you will, voluntarily exploitation because now the, the state is controlled by the masses, so the state now pays certificates to the workers. It's no longer paid by the c capitalists in the form of wages. It's now certificates from the state. The state is a worker state, a working class state. So if you do use the word exploitation, the best you could say is it's voluntary or, or a w working class chosen exploitation to build the socialist system. No, I think it's more than that. It's also that the state is going to be determining in the employer. So the state is, it's not just that the state's. The state's the employer providing government money instead of private providing private But it's not just a provision of money, it's also the state will determine the wages and they're going to determine, as he says, you will get paid back what you put in. Well, who determines that? The and state will determine. You well, know, he does do that. He talks about that, but then the question you have is, how is he trying to balance this? Leon's right. Well, he does require state money. You've got to have a government money system, and that's part of the planks of the Communist Manifesto to put in a central bank. But he's also talking here about, it's a step further, the state is also determining what your certificate is. The capitalists no longer pay, pay out, the state does. The state has taken over the capital. All the capital has been nationalized. But then if it is based on a person's labor, is the good worker paid more yeah, he talks about that, yeah. To start That's with, the, in the transition period, the slogan is from each according to his ability to each according to his work. Yeah. To his work. Nuh -uh, that's not the transition. The slogan in the Soviet Union is from each according to his ability to each according to his work. And that's in Marx. And that's what this transition phase is, but who decides ability and work, what they're producing, it's done by the state, not by the capitalists anymore. Does he, uh, does 
envisage that the, the ruling dictatorship would be elected, or how does he envisage that they would come about? Who would, it, who would put them forward? So that's the election. It's no, it's the so the people will decide. Question. I don't know. Uh, he he talks in some phases. Um, I tried to make the case last week, and uh, Leanne sort of disagreed strongly, and I think I have to go back and do some more homework on that. My bias is I think he pushed for democratic decisions, or one-party democratic type decision, in some of his writings, but there's other people that have made the argument that he's not looking at that at all, that you look in his writings and he's really calling for an enlightened dictatorship. Would Well, the question. The, that's one of the that's one of the fundamental questions I have in the transition is how do the people decide who has this power? Um, Why well, say? Don't I just say that right? Um, Right. That's what I said. As benevolent despots, if I may, but as despots. No, that's definitely the, what he's saying. Now, whether those... No, the working class have to be changed. Yes. They have to get rid of the bourgeois tendencies. Well, no, I once said that they don't want communism. What they want, may, they don't know what communism is, but they don't want capitalism by this stage. They don't want capitalism. They want something else, but they don't know yet how to, they, they, the collective consciousness is going to be formed in the dictatorship somehow. And the Soviet Union is great experiments with changing art, changing literature, changing music, to have socialist art, socialist literature, to change the consciousness of the people. And we saw the Pol Pot regime try to do it overnight with their, their approach in Kampuchea, is to change consciousness, to move towards this collectivist system. Mm -hmm. And you have to, as it says here, that um, you have to get rid of all these old things, it vested th this muck from the old society. You got to get rid of it. Oh, sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. He, there's a role for the credit system, just as an aside. In here, as I said, a complete government, government, the monopoly of the credit banking system. He says, finally, there is no doubt that the credit system will serve as a powerful lever during the transition from the capitalist mode of production to the mode of production of associated labor, but only as one element in connection with other great organic revolutions in the mode of production itself. So the state has taken over credit. I might add, and I'll mention a name later, a British economist named John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s advocates nationalization of credit as a means of saving capitalism. There was that the investment decisions should be made by the state, not by the capitalist system. Very similar to Marx's view. Okay, credit money will be loaned to direct producers, which would presuppose the non-existence of the capitalist mode of production. It would not be loaned to the industrial capitalists, which is precisely the assumption based upon the capitalist mode of production. I don't know what he means there, but it means something like, if you think of the black taxis, lending the money directly to the taxi driver. That's what I would say. Yes, Mr. Lending the money to the farmers. Lending the money to the farmers would, would fit in with that, directly to the producer, not, not to some intermediary capitalist. Um, well, not in Marx's view of what it, but it is today in this country, obviously, if the state's lending money. It is in the states, too. Private property becomes nationalized property, so there's still property. Communism is a positive expression of the overcoming of private property appearing first of all as generalized private property. In other words, eventually communism will, you'll get rid of property, but first the way you get rid of property is you nationalize it. So it's still property, but now the state owns the property. When we move to communism, we have to get rid of the state, too. Okay, communism. <coughs> 
communism is going to be the second phase, and as Leon pointed out, it hasn't happened yet, and um, we've, it's not on the horizon anywhere, as far as I know. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of affairs. It's a frightening statement to me. He says the way we bring in communism is to destroy everything that exists right now. Then it'll come. Um, the solution to all the evils and shortcomings of capitalism is the proletarian revolution and the emergence of communism. What does communism look like? How does it function? How are goods produced and distributed? What is the underlying mode of production? Marx does not say. He says that capitalism is based on an underlying mode of production of wage labor, capital ownership. Communism will somehow be something different, but he doesn't spell it out. He doesn't say what it will be, how it will look. In the German ideology written in 1844, he has a glowing picture of what this state should look like. He says, and this is one of his few comments about communism, while well, in communist society where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to don one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, shepherd, or critic. The communist man is a renaissance man. They can do anything, anytime they want. While, quote, society regulates the general production. Well, what does that mean? How is that going to work? What's, what's going on here? Well, it's all individual freedom and some type of, his idea of the communist man is this renaissance man in a collectivist consciousness, if that makes any sense. Nice system, I'll go hang out there. Well, we, you see small commune type systems happening all over the place. In the early 70s in Colorado, it was a big thing. We'll grow your hair long, do lots of drugs, and move on to the mountains and get into these collectivist communes. This is, I think, one still left because about every six months in Denver they have a feature story of, about the commune that's there. What he's talking about, though, is not just building a community center. He's talking about running nuclear power plants, running train systems, running massive industrial centers, all based on volunteerism, or if you feel like it, you can go fishing this morning, or you can go work at the factory, or you can go and write a play, or you can go to a play, or you just, you know, and society regulates, you know, and we're all happy and smiling and singing and all this stuff. I think he's nuts. Um, <laughs> and give lectures on Marx in the evening. Yeah, right. I mean, that's his idea. Critique, <laughs> critique of the Gotha program. He says, this is now 1875, he says, in the higher, f another, one of the other f short paragraphs on communism, in the higher phase of communist society, after enslaving subordination of individuals under the division of labor, he's going to abolish the division of labor, as you see, because we can do anything, and therewith also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor, um, what is it, from a forms of mere means of life has itself become the prime necessity of life, from, this should be, from a mere means of life has itself become the prime necessity of life. My spell checker doesn't check when I spell the word wrong and make another word. That's, I have to learn how to teach it to do that. Um, <laughs> after the productive forces have also increased with the all-around development of the individual, the all-around development of the individual somehow increased productivity, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly. Only then can a narrow horizon of bourgeois right be fully left behind and society inscribed on its banners from each according to its ability to each according to his needs. 
Right. That's, this is the higher phase. Now we get rid of each according to his work. We go from the trans. We were in the transition. Now we're in communism. Once we get rid of bourgeois, once we get this collect communist consciousness, then the, then we have this new system, each according to his need. Uh, Murray Rothbard, who's an American economist, is described as a gar garbage heap theory of socialism, where you can think of, oh, say, up by Zoo Lake, everybody in the city here produces goods, and they all bring it up to the park by Zoo Lake. They throw all the goods in the park, and then you go to the park, and you take what you want. So everybody does what they want, and they all go down, and they drop off Marxist lectures and automobiles and brain surgeon services and whatever, and then you go up to the park, and you take home what you want. And his problem, Murray says, is who picks up the garbage after all this stuff is left over? And um, that's this idea that we're all going to somehow do what um, we were able to do, and then we're just going to take from the group what we need. In, the, in communism, the money and credit disappear, as I've emphasized throughout the lectures. In the case of socialized production, the money capital is eliminated. Society distributes labor power and the means of production to the different branches of production. The producers may, for all that matters, receive paper vouchers entitling them to withdraw from social, the social supplies of consumer goods, a quantity corresponding to their labor <coughs> time. These vouchers are not money, they do not circulate. Notice the word society. He's not saying state there, it's just society. Religion disappears. Pardon me? Pardon me? This, this is yeah. Yeah, well, the reason I put this in the higher was the word society. Now it's not the state, because in the higher phase, the state doesn't do it. It's just done somehow by society, whatever that means. Religion disappears. Communism begins immediately with atheism. But atheism and communism are no poverty-stricken regression to unnatural and undeveloped simplicity. They are rather the first real emergence and genuine realization of man's essence as something actual. Religion is no longer necessary. The family disappears. The bourgeois family will vanish with the vanishing of capital. And he, in that part of the Communist Manifesto, I didn't put the quote in because it's long, he makes the argument that there is no proletariat family. That, that only the bourgeoisie has families. Family is a bourgeois concept. Marriage disappears and women are collectivized. I like this part of the proposal. <laughs> a bourgeois, not to speak of common prostitutes, take the greatest pleasure in seducing each other's wives. Bourgeois marriage is in reality a system of wives in common, and thus at most what the communists might possibly be reproached with is that they desire to introduce an openly legalized community of women. That's nice, right from the Communist Manifesto. The state disappears, and this is important now. In the higher phase, the state goes. The state was this institution that creates communism. It goes. When in the course of development, class distinctions have disappeared and all production has been consecrated in the hands of associated individuals, the public power will lose its political character. Politics goes. The next quote is taken from Engels, and it's famous for the withering away of the state. This is from his book, anti During. Engels wrote a few things on his own without Marx. As soon as there is no longer any class of society to be held in subjection, as soon as, along with class domination and the struggle for individual existence based on the former anarchy of production, i.e., the marketplace, the collusions and excesses arising from these have also been abolished. There is nothing more to be repressed which would make a repressive force a state necessary. The interference of the state power in social relations becomes superfluous in <coughs> one sphere after another and then seizes of itself. The government of persons is replaced by the administration of things and the direction of the processes of production. The state is not abolished, it withers away. That's Engels' famous line about how in the move towards communism will see the state withering away. Yeah, collectivist anarchy. Yeah, well, definitely an anarchy. Yes, Eustace. And then the rivers will run, run up here, right. That's about what it gets to here. The economy is a collectivized, associated individuals now operate an economy without the institution of government. Communism overturns the basis of all earlier relations of production and intercourse and subjugates them to the power of united individuals. It turns existing conditions into conditions of unity. The reality which communism is creating is precisely the true basis for rendering it impossible that anything should exist independently as individuals. Everything is collectivized and there's no state to do the collectivizing. Okay, critique. Um, 
Marx's view of a post-capitalist social order, I say, is dangerously incomplete. The transition from capitalism to communism entails total state control over the entire society. He advocates nationalize the means of production, abolish property and the rule of law, continually destroy the remnants of the bourgeois society, massively centralize power. And then my question is, how is this process to be controlled, which is brought up earlier with the question on democracy. The proletariat dictatorship controls this all-powerful state. How is this dictatorship structured? How is it to be truly democratic? How are the people assured of maintaining power? Marx does not say. I would contend that his political economic model of transition sets the stage for the brutal, bloody dictatorships of Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. That his proposal for dictatorship sets the stage for what we've seen, brutal dictatorship. Once the all-powerful state emerges, then next question, how is it going to wither away? Marx proposes a transition from democratic capitalism to dictatorial statism to anarchistic collectivism. The transition process to the final stage, anarchistic collectivism with communism, is not at all obvious. He doesn't say anything about how it's going to happen. Let's assume that we even get there. So we've got a problem is first, how do we set up a t dictatorship that's going to be fair, equitable, just? Second of all, how do we get rid of that dictatorship once we set it up to move to the higher phase of communism? Third of all, once we get there, what the heck does that phase really mean? What does it look like, this higher stage of communism? How does it work? How are goods produced and distributed? What is the underlying mode of production that makes it essentially different from capitalism? How do people relate in this system? And I would say communism is a fantasy. It doesn't exist. Let's take a break, and we'll do so the socialist critique. There's one question. Sure. Um, uh, not a question. Uh, oh, what do you want to make a comment? One, excuse me, Eustace, you want to do it now before I lose the masses? <laughs> okay, you can go with your question. Don't take a break yet. Uh, not a question so much. I, my, my job is computers and networks in particular. Imagine a massive big computer, total network on every TV set and telephone set and whatever it is, with, where you can, there's a question tonight, BW or whoever it is, Nelson Mandela stands up and says, we are voting on this press yes or no or whatever, or abstain, and so on. How would that fit in? The communist system, you've got this thing, you get out to the masses. Can't work. So imagine them all voting on whether or not we're going to have Coca-Cola tea tonight. Mm -hmm. It's fine. All right. Where? Whether or not I should go to the bathroom right now. We'll have a national election on how I should use my individual body right this minute and go to the toilet. And one for you, and one for you, and one for you, and so we're going to vote as a collective. It's just naive. With all the computers in the world, we'll see the information of time and place cannot be centralized, cannot be collectivized. There's too many individualistic aspects of existence that it's impossible for any state to control them. That's the argument. The computers may be fine, but they aren't going to be able to decide collectively when, and when I can go to the toilet. It couldn't, you couldn't tally it up. We could not efficiently run a society in which we had to vote collectively on when we were dismissed in this meeting. Huh? You'd spend your whole life voting. You couldn't do it. That's besides the point. It's conceivably impossible. Couldn't be done. That's the, no, that is the point. You could not run a modern system with automobiles and electricity and TVs and discotheques. run this stuff if you had it all collectively decided, but that's the next, that's part three. Yeah, well, that's the, the Mises called socialism plan chaos. Let's see. Being in is which question You'd have to have all of them be voted on if it's a collective society. That's the point. Collectivism means there's no individualism. The individual's gone. We, can, we cannot individually decide when we're going to go to the bathroom. That's a collective decision. You can't be a robot. If you do, if you do, if you do vote, you say yes. But intrinsically, in you, my yes is different from yours. Well, we could uh, we could have a majority rule system with yeah, your computer right. system, but my point is, you cannot collectively make decisions about everything that goes on in the society. It's a plan and possibility. And it's just that you can no, plan what you can do beforehand you without going through it. You can't make all the decisions. You don't have to vote on every. Well you, do, well, you don't have to vote on everything, but if you, ideally with Marx, there would be this consciousness that decides it. Sort of like we've got little 
mental telepathy, brain waves, and we sort of think together. Some science fiction books I've seen that have gone a step further than that talk about putting a little slot in your brain with this little cassette tape that you plug in and you plug into the main computer. And then the main computer programs you when it's time for you to have sex and things like that. And it's great fun, you know, these science fiction books. And then the individual breaks off and they pull the cassette tape out and they have to the struggle with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantasy. What Marxists are saying is that we cannot think of that society because we still have bourgeois consciousness. Yeah. See, everything you've been saying here is still on the premise of individuality. People voting by pushing buttons, having different opinions. The whole thing about the Marxist society is that that thinking of yourself as an individual vanishes. It's gone. There's a yeah. collective consciousness, a sort of group thought, that people just feel uh, that it's time a freeway was built somewhere. And uh, it gets built. No people for or against. You don't vote. You never had different opinions. You, you feel it's time that there was a disco or a football match. Uh, it's just a kind of, a kind of uh, group thought. You yeah. see? Now that Marxists will say that we cannot think about such a society because we don't yet have that consciousness. We're still trapped in our bourgeois individualistic uh, what are you saying is that it's essential that everybody in this room must be killed no no because no. we because you will not be able to relinquish that no we'll learn present thinking we'll always be the same to well, the dissenters have to be killed. That's the permanence of the revolution. Well, there's a major problem in, in, in your argument. I, I agree that your analysis is probably correct, but Marx could never have thought of that. He couldn't be a Marxist. No, he's, he, he's got to the stage where he's, he's thought enough to say that we have to destroy the institutions of capitalism. Then I can't say how the people will think once we get beyond that. But he's saying that he wants to push his society to the point of the dictatorship. And that's it. That's why he only says a few things about communism, because he says, you know, we aren't there yet. That's good. I give up. Change your opinion. No, no, no. Excuse me. One other question here. Theoretically, in terms of Marxist, Marxist vision of a lawless, anarchistic society, um, I should be able to walk into a factory with a private army or a posse of people that I've got together and take that place and go to hijack that place and make it produce what I want. But you wouldn't do that. But would I, just because I was a communist and died in the war, would I not even think of doing yeah. it? Yeah, because you... What, what's to stop me? Is it my collective consciousness? What would stop you is the dictatorship of the proletariat until there's nobody like you left, until <laughs> there's nobody that would think of something like that, and then you can get rid of the state until there's no threat. Until no, then, we have a dictatorship. Frank, everything is flowing so, so that... The, 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 Everyone agrees with what's happening, so there's no pressure to disagree. Yeah, so but it's, yeah, you have to get to that point. And you get these, you can read novels, a good novel is Anthem by Ayn Rand, where she talks, they discover the word we, the word, there's a group where everybody speaks we, and they discover the word I. And as, uh, actually, she stole the idea from a book by Zamitan called We, which is a Russian novelist who talks about this discovery of this word I in a communist system, and this person that has this word I, and what do they do with it, you know, and then it's quite a revolutionary thing, this word I, is, you know, because everybody refers to themselves as we in these societies. Eustace, you've got, speaking of... Yeah, the first thing I'd like to find out is where my list is, my list of names. And then... I'd like to ask anybody who hasn't paid you. <laughs> okay, let's take a break then. Um, can we take a break and we'll talk afterwards? I think we all need, at least I need a break. <laughs> Settled in there. The last of the cookie eaters. Okay, the, the last section that I want to conclude on is called Socialist Calculation. And as I said, this is an economic analysis of whether or not a post-capitalist system can efficiently calculate or efficiently allocate and distribute resources. And what I'll do is I'm going to do this, as I said earlier, as a combination of history and theory. Um, what we have with Lenin is the first attempt to set up, major attempt to set up a post-capitalist system 
it's a failure. From that comes a theoretical critique and so on. So let me see if we can walk through this. It's a huge debate, the socialist calculation of Bain. And I'm just giving you some of the key figures. We'll start with Lenin. Lenin was in exile in Switzerland and set up the Third International, called it the Communist Party, and set up the institutional structure to t set up a, a communist system in, the, in this, what is now the Soviet Union. He comes in in 1917, we talked about him then in the first lecture, and sets up a successful coup. Once he comes into power, he immediately starts to tear down capitalism, which is what a good dictator of the proletariat should do. He abolishes the Constituent Assembly in Petrograd by force, goes in with guns, cuts that out. He sets up a Union of Soviet Socialist Republics with his intention that this is going to start a worldwide socialist revolution. He's, this guy's just not content with Russia. He's going for the world. Um, he debauches the currency, he nationalizes industry, he conscripts labor, confiscates property, breaks contracts and agreements, throws out the rule of law, violates civil rights, and ends political liberty. And this is a section here I read from Paul Johnson to give you a feel for how quickly he moved. Meanwhile, with great speed, if in some confusion, the physical apparatus of power was being occupied by the Bolshevik activists. This physical takeover is given quickly in infrastructure of decreed law. 10th November, Peter the Great's Table of Ranks abolished. 22nd November, house search searches authorized, fur coats confiscated. I like that one. 11th December, all schools taken from the church and handed to the state. I mean, the revolution is in October. This guy's moving fast. 14th December, state monopoly of all banking activity, all industry subject to workers' control. 16th December, all army ranks abolished. 21 December, new law code for revolutionary courts. 24th December, immediate nationalization of all factories. 29th of December, all payments on interest and dividends stopped. Bank withdrawal strictly limited. The guy moved quick before the end of the year. Believing as he did that violence was an essential element in the revolution, Lenin never quarreled before the need to employ terror. Within a few months of seizing power, Lenin had abandoned the notion of individual guilt and with it the whole Judeo-Christian ethic of personal responsibility. The watershed was Lenin's decree of January 1918, which is right then, right after the next month, calling on the agencies of the state to, quote, purge the Russian land of all kinds of harmful insects, end quote. Quite quickly, the condemned group decree laws extended to whole classes and the notion of killing people collectively rather than individually was seized upon by the Cheka professionals with enthusiasm. Cheka is the beginning of the KGB that Lenin founded. It wasn't known that he had founded this until 10 years after he did. He had set up a secret terrorist police force. And then he goes on and explains how children have to watch their parents be killed and so on so that they get the right spirit. You know and everything. Lenin started all this. By 1919, the economy had fallen apart. 1917 is the revolution. Industrial production was at a standstill. There was no food in the cities. Inflation was rampant. A massive civil war ravished the country. Nonetheless, Lenin continued with his plan of forcefully implementing Marxist communism. By 1921, two years later, things were even worse. The country was totally devastated. And on top of that, the revolution had not spread internationally as he expected. So he wasn't getting international aid. He wasn't getting help from abroad, and there wasn't any food at home. And in 21, the economy was on the verge of total collapse. Not in 21. Not, 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 not. What happens in 21 is that there's a switch in policy, and that switch in policy allows him to get aid overseas. In um, massive food is the basic thing. The masses are starving to death by this time. Um, Lenin introduced something in May of 1921 called New Economic Planning. New economic planning was a return to the market. He allowed market processes, initially with barter, and he allowed farmers to produce food and keep it, and manufacturers to produce goods and keep them, and then trade with barter. So he reintroduced an exchanged economy. And initially with barter, then it went to money, wages, prices, and everything else. It wasn't, as Paul Johnson notes, it wasn't in time to get a good harvest in 21, and that winter of 21, 22, 3 million people died of starvation. At, in 22, World War Wilson spent, sent millions and millions of pounds of food to help the starving people in Russia. The U.S. government did. That money, food was distributed through the central government of the Soviet Union and maintained Soviet power. Some people believe the state would have fallen if it hadn't been for the relief aid of the United States done to help the starving masses. Okay, so I said the first. Distributed as, as aid that came from, from the government. Yes, it was came from the government, so the government fed the people. 
so they stayed in power. Just like in Ethiopia, exactly the same. Same thing, which is another brutal Marxist dictatorship. The first serious attempt to move from capitalism to a dictatorship of the proletarian to communism failed. The first attempt to put in Marx's plans in action fell apart. Okay. The theoretical critique starts with Ludwig von Mises. In 1920, Mises, who's an Austrian economist working in Vienna, who had already um, established himself in monetary theory, he had developed a very intricate theory of business cycles, writes an article called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, and it's in the book Collectivist Economic Planning that I mentioned. In that, Mises argues that rational, efficient economic calculation was impossible in socialism. Prices, wages, interests, and profits are required to allocate factors of production. They are necessary to distribute commodities. You need numbers generated from market forces on which to plan, to make decisions. He emphasizes the importance of prices determined by what he called exchange value. Exchange value comes from the spontaneous interactions of supply and demand in the marketplace. The value of something in exchange, what something's worth in exchange. Units of money are important to quantify exchange value. You need money to say that this thing's worth 10 rand, that's worth 2 rand, that's worth 25 rand. So Mises says that monetary calculation is essential for economic calculation. You need a money system in order to calculate. Quote from that article, the monetary calculation affords us a guide through the oppressive plenitude of economic potentialities. It enables us to extend to all goods of a higher order. What he means by that, all investment goods. All investment goods, the judgment of value. It renders their value capable of computation and thereby gives us the primary basis for all economic operations with goods of a higher order. Without it, all production involving processes of capitalistic production would be groping in the dark. If we don't have a money system, we don't know what the heck we're doing. In 22, he extends it into socialism and economic and sociological analysis, this massive work, as I've said, or mentioned earlier, that this is the counterpart to Das Kapital. This is the critique of socialism. Um, he talks about uh, foreign affairs, family, economics. He has a whole section on the enslavement of women in socialism <coughs> and how capitalism liberates women which is quite risque for an old conservative guy in the 20s from Austria. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there, but what I'll focus here on is his economic analysis. Um, as Hayek notes in the foreword to this edition, when socialism first appeared in 1922, its impact was profound. This book. Um, I had a professor named George Zinke, who is German-speaking American, born in Wisconsin. There's still a fair amount of people in Wisconsin that speak German as a first language very much of a Marxist, and he taught me history of economic thought. And one of the things he said is, in the course, when we got to Ludwig von Mises, read everything Ludwig von Mises has, but don't believe any of it, because he's wrong. And he, because he just, Mises was the enemy to this guy, George Zinke. And George Zinke said that he read this book in Germany as a graduate student, a postgraduate student in the 20s, and burned it. This book <laughs> had to be burned. And uh, would tell us that. This, this was the book to attack. Um, and it created quite an impact because everybody saw Lenin as this great leader now, this leading all this stuff, and here's this guy saying, nah, it just doesn't work. It just can't work. Uh, so, um, and I, like I said today, I still think it's, it's, it has incredible impact. Um, so I say, here's this Austrian economist saying with conviction that socialism couldn't work. I know that we could devote an entire lecture series to his criticism. That's a little pitch. If you guys want one on Mises, we can do that <laughs> for five lectures, now that you've had Marx. Um, Mises is spectacular to study. Um, he's Marx, Mises is saying in this book also the importance of monetary calculation. So that's one of the key critiques of socialism. It throws out money. It's necessary, monetary calculation is necessary for economic calculation. But in this book, he takes it a step further and he makes the point, who does the calculating? Who makes the key economic decisions? And in Mises' view, it's the entrepreneur. He argues that capitalism works because it is a process of entrepreneurship. It's a word that's totally lost in Marx. The closest he gets is the industrial capitalist. And socialism fails because it outlaws the entrepreneur. It outlaws the creative, individualistic, risk-taker, alert individual. Says Mises, Clearly any, and this is written in the 20s now, clearly any analysis of the capitalist order must take as its central point not capital, Marx is wrong, not capital, nor the capitalists, but the entrepreneur. 
But socialism, including Marxian socialism, sees in the entrepreneur as someone alien to the process of production, someone whose whole work consists in the appropriation of surplus value. You can tell Mises is as right as Marx. He knows what he's talking about. But the entrepreneur fulfills a task which must be performed in a socialist community. This the socialist does not see, or at least refuses to see. Even in a socialist community, every economic operation must be based on an uncertain future. The future is unknowable, as Hayek says, but imaginable. Its economic consequence remains uncertain even if it is te technically successful. The economic relevance of actions are uncertain. To see and to act in advance, to follow new ways, is always the concern only of the few, the leaders. Socialism is the economic policy of the crowd, of the masses, remote from insight into the na nature of economic activity. Then he attacks the Lenin. He says, it is for this reason that it was quite impossible for Lenin to realize the causes of the failure of his policy. In his life and his reading, he remained so far removed from the facts of economic life that he was as great a stranger to the work of the bourgeoisie as a Hottentot to the work of an explorer taking geographical measurements. <laughs> <laughs> that Lenin, just like Marx, these guys don't know how to run a business, is basically what he's saying. They don't know anything about going out and putting your money on the line and taking risks. They don't know how to do it. He didn't know what he was doing wrong. There's some very there's some things when I write about that time he had a massive heart attack and he was sort of out of it for the last few years of his life so maybe he had backed off and part of it was that he had to stay power that that's one argument is that he people it's just there's it's a couple arguments one is that this guy lost it up here another one is is that he realized that they were going to actually flat out lose power if they didn't do something. I mean, the system had totally fallen apart. They had to, they had to back off. They were going to, I mean, the system was. at least understood that his ideas were the problem. The, no, the revisionist theory is that the period from 1917 to 1921 is a period of war communism, and the disaster was caused by the war, not the communism. That's the argument that's made, is that the reason that Russia fell apart was due to the Civil War, internally and that Lenin had to back off, put in some capitalist institutions because the war destroyed them, and then build from there onto communism. That's, that's how they reinterpret it. Now, I think the new Glasnost vision stuff that's going on might start critiquing that and start calling a spade a spade and saying that Lenin destroyed the system, the economy. For Mises, capitalism is the only solution. In order to make socialism work, it must become capitalistic, and this is what will happen. With the new economic planning in 1921, this is exactly what Lenin did. And at the end of the handout, I think, did, I, did that get reproduced? I don't know. Three pages? There's a section from, I decided since I was giving you all this little print, I'd use our new Xerox machine and give you some big prints, so I blew it up. There's three pages from Socialism, where Mises argues that the only way to ensure an efficient socialist system is to give responsibility to the managers, and once you do that, you just walk right into capitalism. You can read that on your own. We don't have to go through that, but that's just sort of an excerpt of his type of analysis. Capitalism, the only solution. Okay. That's by Mises. Yeah, that section is from Socialism. I should have typed it on the top, sorry. But that's three pages out of this book. Okay. The third person, just briefly to throw in, is Stalin. What's happened now is it's 1920s. Lenin literally has a heart attack. He's phased out of the picture. The so Soviet Union is some type of a centralized system with market process somewhere in there. It's a, it's a chaos. Stalin comes to the forefront and, and shapes everything up. And Stalin, it puts in central economic planning. He, it's not Lenin. He's the one that comes up with central planning. I would I argue that the Russian economy had been centralized, and then it was decentralized, but it had never really been planned. It was sort of at the point of a gun on the Lenin, and Stalin comes up with this notion of, of central plans. He forcefully collectivizes agriculture. That's one of the things that Stalin does. He sets up massive collective firms. He, he reinstitutes a state monopoly in capital. Everything's controlled by capital. He has conscripted, conscripted and enslaved labor both, and he sets up a reign of terror like Lenin to push the system through. But what he does is he does it through what he calls five-year plans. I would argue that socialism under Stalin becomes state monopoly capitalism. 
It's not socialism anymore. Since Stalin, communism and socialism have come to mean the control of capitalism by the state, not the abolishment of capitalism. There is no socialist country existing that has successfully abolished capitalist relations, would be my argument. They can't. If they abolish it, the system falls apart. Okay, where does this go in the theoretical world? How is Stalin sort of rationalized? And Stalin was a big thing back then. Everybody saw this guy as a great guy. There's a new big debate for how to make socialism work which is to critique Mises. Mises says it won't work, so the socialists come back and say we're going to make it work. One of the major characters is Oscar Lange. Oscar Lange, in 1938, publishes a counterattack. This is 10 years after the first five-year economic plan is started that argues for something called market socialism. He wants to make socialism work by applying the principles of, the mar of a market economy within a socialist context. In his little article on the economic theory of socialism, Lange sort of sarcastically praises Mises. He says, both as an expression of the recognition for the great service rendered by him and as a memento of the prime importance of sound economic accounting, a statue of Professor Mises ought to occupy an honorable place in the great hall of the Ministry of Socialization of the Central Planning Board of the Socialist State. So he wants to thank the old man for bringing out this, this problem that we've got. Ten years after Stalin introduces the first five-year plan, Lange presents a theoretical model for central planning. There are other people before him, and Lange digs out a character named Baroni. Baroni wrote an, an argument for central planning before the Russian Revolution. Baroni was an Italian. His articles also reproduced in collectivist economic planning. So Lange says, Mises, you're wrong. This Italian already figured out how to do it 10 years before you wrote your book. And then there's a guy named Taylor in America, a character that that came, F. W. Taylor, that came up with an idea, but Lange is the one that's sort of the, 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 the main force, theoretical force behind market socialism. Was Stalin working on his own ideas? Yeah, Stalin was, a, Stalin was a common, what he did is he took the American corporate model and combined it with the revolutionary fever, as he called it, terror, we might want to call it tonight, and said that this is what he's going to do. So he, he set up the Soviet Union as one big giant corporation. <laughs> Basically, and he had people with him. You know, there was a lot of problems. He would have people, economists working for him, and once in a while, economists on the Stalin that would predict that markets would rise again, he'd shoot them. You know, because <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen anytime. So he had he had economists working for him, but they were always getting shot. <laughs> Kondratiev was one of the biggies. Um, he, he, Kondratiev predicted that capitalism would come up after the depression. And, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to work in, under him. I would have been shot a long time ago. Him. Um, did he sustain his change plans with any literature at all? Did he justify it? Did it fit into the system that he had previously? So Stalin or? Yeah, Stalin. What Stalin, what Stalin did is just put in a, it was a totalitarian dictatorship. And he forced that country into the modern world, forced it to industrialize at the cost of a 20 million plus people that were killed. He killed off millions of people and forced it. Just, you know, slave labor, massive, massive industrialization. Then, you know. Did you write any books? To yeah, he has little books. You can get them. I don't know if you get them down here. Yeah, he's got little books that he writes about the his idea. Yeah. yeah. Not to justify the killing. They don't talk no. about the killing, but to justify no. the collectivization. The killing sort of, sh it's not really publicized. Yeah, he was killing millions before Hitler oh, got yeah. to power. You know. um, <coughs> when I start. Pardon me? Before I starved to death, he killed him. We killed and starved people both. A, I, we talked earlier about what he did to Ukraine, which is quite incredible. Millions killed in the Ukraine in the early 30s. Um, so Lange, but Lange is sort of interesting. What he does says, he's, I argue that he abandoned socialism in the allocation and distribution. I don't argue this, what he does. He abandoned socialism in the allocation and distribution of consumer goods and labor power. Only raw materials and capital goods are to be socialized or controlled by the state. Says Lange, in the socialist system as described, we have a genuine market in the institutional sense of the word for consumer goods and for the services of labor. But there is no market for capital goods and productive resources outside labor. Outside of labor. Um, productive resources are outside of labor. Labor is London. labor has a lab, land is nationalized but labor isn't there's a market for I think that's outside of or outside labor yeah except for labor 
The government has monopoly over capital and natural resources. There's no market for these factors. And Mises would say, without a market, there's no structure of relative prices. The relative values of alternative factors cannot be calculated and applied to the production process. Mises would say, without a market, you don't have prices. Without prices, you can't calculate. Lange says, I've got a solution. Lange says, the central planning board can set prices by a process of trial and error. If prices are too high, inventories will rise. If they are too low, inventories will fall. Malangi wants to imitate the market. The central planners will imitate the market. Quote, the central planning board performs the function of the market. It establishes the rules for combining factors of production and choosing the scale of output of a plant, for determining the outputs of an industry, for the allocation of resources, and for the parametric uses of prices and accounting. Finally, it fixes prices so as to balance the quantity supplied with the quantity demanded of each commodity. It follows that a substitution of planning for the functions of the market is quite possible and workable. Agricultural control boards do that. That's the type of central planning. But note how far Lange has drifted from Marx's dream of a post-capitalist society. The reality of Lange's market socialism is state monopoly capitalism. Where is the socialism in this model? Where is the real socialism? Look at the labor market. Specifically, the labor market is exactly the same as it is under laissez-faire capitalism. Workers sell their labor power for a wage. If wage labor exists, which he says it does, is a market free market for labor, if that exists, and you've got Marxist alienation and Marxist exploitation. And all I can think of is Marx would call Lange a vulgar Marxist. He would not accept this as a model of socialism. This is the model that's adopted by most socialists today. They've given up. They can't run a post-socialist system. What they've done is they've got state-controlled capitalism. It's not a free society, but it's not socialism either. The price of this, the critical issue is that the price mechanism doesn't work. The prices are fixed in some areas, but not in others. They, it depends on the country that you look at. In the Soviet Union, they've got fairly free prices in a lot of agriculture now. In consumer goods, they what they do is they pay one price for consumer goods. They pay one price for the factory. The factories deal with that price. There's another price that the consumers face, and in between is what's called the turnover tax. And the, the planning boards will look at inventories and say, oh, there's too many tackies on the shelves. OK, let's lower the prices. Or there's too few, let's raise the prices. And they do that. They don't do it like the market, which does it constantly. They do it you know, yearly and so on. Where they have real problems is they don't have any meaningful prices in capital goods and raw materials. They do have prices in labor. And they use labor prices quite effectively to allocate labor in the country. They have a market for labor. My point is this. Can you argue that it's near capitalism in your key element of the it's, it's, it's corrupted capitalism. It's perverted capitalism because it's not what Marx is saying is we're going to get rid of these institutions of money, wages, prices, interest. This is the whole thing that Marx is advocating to destroy. What these people say is, no, the way we're going to make socialism work is to use all these institutions of capitalism, money, wages, prices, interest, and so on. But we didn't have to stay control them, but we're still going to use these institutions. Isn't that what the, we, the, the boards do? Here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, that's one people call Praetorial Socialist System. It's National Socialist. It's not that much different in that way. The, the way Praetorial controls the South African economy and the way Moscow controls the Soviet economy in some ways is very similar. And they're controlling key, key industries, nationalized, and so on. Yeah. But, that's, it's, uh, it's, but it's, it's not socialist in a Marxian sense of getting rid of these institutions. It's controlling the institutions. And, and we, Push on. The problem with this now, what happens is that people, a lot of people accept this. Lange's argument becomes acceptable. In many socialists say, see, Mises is wrong, socialism is work, all we have to do is have the central planning boards play market. They can pretend like they're the marketeers and then, then it'll work. We're used, and so therefore, and this sort of Mises Marx debate gets lost. And what Hayek does, he comes in and says, the real problem is one of information or one of knowledge. Even if you're going to play market, you're not going to have enough information. This goes back to the comments on computers. Hayek is, is writing at a time in the 30s where there's great desire for state intervention in countries all around the world. As we talked about earlier, you see national socialism in Germany, fascism in Italy, Bolshevik socialism in the Soviet Union. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, 
the, the, the demand for interventionalist moves in, in the UK by John Maynard Keynes in his general theory, which comes out in 1937. And John Maynard Keynes calls for a massive discretionary fixed fiscal policy to save capitalism. And one of the things he calls for is this nationalizing investment. Um, we call Keynesian economics today. Hayek, in the face of all this, attacking the socialist calculation debates and attacking Keynes, advances the knowledge question. Is the state capable of collecting and using the knowledge needed to plan an economy? Without a decentralized market process, can the knowledge necessary for coordinating economic activity even be generated? So what Hayek does, he says, okay, we'll give you your planning boards, we'll give you prices, we'll give you wages, we'll let you use these capitalist institutions, but if the state uses these, they can't use them efficiently because they can't get the information and good information on which to make decisions. So the debate takes sort of a different shift with Hayek. The information which the central planning authority would need would also include complete description of all the relevant technical properties of every one of these goods, including cost of movement to any other place, cost of eventual repair, et cetera, et cetera. This leads to another problem of even great, greater importance. In a centrally planned society, this selection of the most appropriate among the known technical methods will only be possible if all this knowledge can be used in the calculations of the central authority. This means in practice that this knowledge will have to be concentrated in the heads of one or at the best of very few people. Can you imagine a central planning board in Pretoria making all business decisions for the whole country? They just, how do you do it? Nobody's got a brain that can put all that into it. There's a third set of data, data relative to the importance of different kinds and quantities of consumer goods. It is probably evident that the mere assembly of these data is a task beyond human capacity. So he argues that planning boards cannot work even if you allow them to be sort of pseudo-capitalistic because they can't generate information needed on which to plan. All the information cannot be absorbed into a small board of 10 people running the country. That comes, that comes from his essay, The Present State of the Debate, where he basically is arguing for the importance of spontaneous, decentralized market process for the generation and dissemination of knowledge. Market processes create information. One of the beauties of capitalism, it creates the knowledge in which we can make decisions. This is, the major paper on this, Hayek writes, is the use of knowledge in society, and it's a fabulous paper. I wish I had a copy of it. I'd pass it out to you, where he argues why markets create knowledge. There he makes a distinction between scientific knowledge and unorganized knowledge. The latter is the one that I find interesting. The unorganized knowledge is the knowledge of a particular circumstance of time and place, when I have to go to the toilet to be blunt. But there's no way that unorganized knowledge can be centralized. It's particular time and place, little things. I want to have a Coke, I don't want to have a Coke. You know, I want to go to lecture, I don't want to go to lecture. I want to watch Channel 2, I want to watch Channel 7. I want to read this book, I want to read that book. Particular time and place knowledge is always going to be decentralized and there's so much of our decisions as people is based on that localized knowledge. You think of the guy selling a newspaper in the corner. He knows what his market is and how many people on average come by, so he knows how many newspapers he needs there. There's no way a board up in Pretoria can decide we need 40 papers here, 30 papers here, 20 papers there, 200 papers there for these people to sell on the street corners. It's those guys know it at their own little street corners. They know that information. That can't be centralized. It's impossible to centralize all that. So what you're saying is then that the whole system operates because of change. Mm -hmm change that is variable all over the place. Yeah. And because this change is, 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 a, is, a, is a, a live thing that's going on all the time. It's always it's, changing. It, it, there's no way you can you can centralize it. Ridiculous. Nobody in Pretoria knows that I drive down Yale Road and buy paper or newspaper from this guy. He knows it. He knows who I am. He's followed me. So do you know, now he knows that there's one more customer in this market. But that isn't something that we had to plan in a five-year plan of how many papers should be allocated at the corner of Empire Road and Yale Road. Just done. That's how markets work. But that's why the, the time and place knowledge is so important, because your idea about the big central computer, especially as technology gets more advanced, people say, well, aren't we just getting to the point to where we're going to be able to technologically get all the information? And if, don't we get a computer big enough? Well, the point is that it's not it's not getting the amount of information that the, the information is only available at the time, and then it changes the next minute. It changes what I mean. I it's don't. It's not amount. It's it's actual time. 
If I go out to dinner tonight, I, I don't even know right now what I'm going to eat. How could Pretoria plan my meal? Mm. I don't even know if I'm going to have pizza or if fish. If they plan it, you eat what they tell you. I'm going to eat what they tell me to do. But then it's, you know, that's not... But a market can provide it. There's all these places out there just waiting to give me a steak or a fish or a salad, waiting for it, and we don't need to have the state decide dinner for the people, you know? It, and it wouldn't be as good, I don't think. It. <laughs> about the central computer concept, there is no way that I put anywhere in my idea, or maybe I explained it badly, that there is a decision process by a machine. What I was saying only is the collectivization of information, the dictatorship of the proletariat via decision making at their place. Okay. Now, this is, no, no, I, this, your point is well taken, especially for democratic decision making. If we were to say move the society or the United States to a society that allowed more referenda, today with modern technology, we can do referenda easier and it makes it a more viable solution. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we want every single decision to be collectively decided upon. And if that's, but given that there are some decisions that. Can you give him a sign? Yeah, we can on that, but you nonetheless, not if you're Marxist. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. Because I, I understand what Marx is talking about when he talks about collective consciousness. He's not talking so much about central planning as a complete consciousness that is one. Right. You don't need to put anything into computer. But this is. There's some kind of perfect knowledge, something that finds a substitution for the way that we acquire information in the marketplace. Somehow, the collective consciousness just gains all of that, and there is a kind of perfect knowledge which seems almost quasi religious. It is very quasi religious, and I mean, it's, it's very religious. But he's the point is, and what we're seeing here is that that's the higher phase of communism. Now, what we're talking about is ampl actually implementing the transition process. To get to the transition process, what do you do? Well, Lenin says, we're going to throw out everything that's capitalism. <laughs> Country falls apart. So they bring capitalism in and they say, hi, what we're going to do is we're going to have market socialism, which means that we're, they've given up. Now they've, they've, they've said that we've got to use market institutions to make this system work. And so far, we haven't seen any move towards collective consciousness that's working. What we do see, and I end with, is we see a move towards markets in the, in the East. Yeah. Frank, uh, referring back to uh, performance, this is where the committee system works. They have a leader, and in the, in, during the duration of this committee, uh, he can step down and somebody else would uh, they have a focalizer. And the other person may be a better focalizer and automatically he uh, becomes the leader. But that is a, a small organic thing. It's small, that's a key and point. There's nothing wrong with collecting. Yeah. There's nothing wrong, no, there's nothing in a market economy that opposes voluntary collectivism. That's what a firm is. Mm -hmm. That's what we are here, we're voluntary collective. Yeah. The problem is the idea of trying to have a massive yeah. industrialized society run on a collective basis. Can I just offer this? That was uh, uh, given to me by a friend who's no longer with us. Uh, he says he got it from Scandinavia, where they have a referendum. The people that vote in the referendum will only be empowered to vote if they have been to lectures that are set up to acquaint themselves of both sides of the question. They can be sleeping, well, there may be more they must at least have been there. And I, I, I submit that that is a, a vast improvement on our current... Depends on who decides what the two sides of the lecture are. <laughs> yes. Yes. And who gives the lecture. Both sides are the same. You can, the same so side. long as there are, you know, it's a democratic thing. Right now, we've got a government by the mass that know nothing. But this is, the, well, this is what you're leading at, which ties back in with Hayek's point, is the question of generating information and whether or not you can generate efficient information in a political process. Um, and some of, the, some of the work that I've done, and there's a theory called public choice theory that I've worked in that looks at generating information in political processes. And I look at my decision to vote in the United States. And it t information is costly. It's expensive. But I will go and vote because it's socially acceptable. So I can say, I'm going to go vote. Now, who I vote for, do, it doesn't matter, just as long as I vote. So I would contend that most Americans vote out of pure ignorance, and most people do. Or they just vote, they pull the party lever, whatever party they're into, because information is so expensive. It's very hard in a political process to generate information 
efficiently in information that we want to learn in markets with prices, wages, rents, and interests. We generate information daily, constantly, on which we make decisions. Leon. You know, speaking for myself, I don't have much faith in the ability of people to learn when they've been to hear a lecture in which they Sorry, we Stalin's views are juxtaposed with Hitler's views, mm -hmm. where P.W.'s views are juxtaposed with Cambo's views. I don't think that improves their ability to vote to one iota. In fact, it diminishes it considerably. But this uh, is a problem. It sends a. Suppose that Leon won't be there to, to balance it. I well, if you. Go, I won't attend the lecture. And let me let me finish off my let me finish off my little section here. Um, Hayek says basically then summarizing Hayek's argument, Marx's markets excuse me slipped there. Markets generate information in the form of prices, wages, interests, and profits. This information is constantly being revised and updated by the unplanned interactions of producers and consumers in the market. Hayek describes capitalism as spontaneous order. Socialism is planned chaos. Mm -hmm. Socialism cannot work because it bans the entrepreneurs that coordinate production and consumption. It cannot work because it prohibits the market processes necessary to generate the knowledge that entrepreneurs require. Okay, and then bear with me through my little conclusion of this thing. I say, it's been seven decades since the Russian Revolution. Marx's higher stage of communism is nowhere in sight. In Russia and in, in its empire, in China, in the third world Marxist nations, there still exist capitalist institutions. One finds money, credit, banking, wages, prices, interests, and profits. In these nations, there exists a propertyless proletariat and is ruled by a class of proletariat dictators, the ruling members of the Communist Party. Nowhere have alienation, exploitation, and crises been believed to be uniquely inherent to capitalism been eradicated. They still exist. The so-called Marxist nations are not Marxist. Their modes of production and consumption are not founded on the principles or the ideals of Marxian communism, nor are these Marxist nations really capitalist. Their modes of production and consumption are not the so-called anarchy of the market. Exchange is not voluntary. Property is not private. These nations are totalitarian political economies established in the powers of the dictators. They exhibit every evil that Marx attributed to capitalism. And I would say it's not surprising that the first real mass proletariat uprising occurred in Poland. That's the first dictator, uh, first proletariat revolution, the Solidarity Movement a few years ago. And developed to improve the conditions of the working class in the face of its repression by the Polish and the Russian state. And this was a socialist movement, not a capitalist movement, to overthrow a class of capitalist dictators which were the state, the communist state. What a perversion of Marx's beliefs. The communist state crushed solidarity in the name of the proletariat, and it's still crushed today. It's still outlawed. Marx opposed private property, exchange, money, capital, and credit. He imposed the, opposed the entire market economy. His political economy tried to show that capitalism is inherently flawed. He tried to prove that it is doomed. I would argue we've witnessed many revolutions and new economic orders brought about in the name of Karl Marx. There's been massive violence and destruction. We have yet to witness his vision of the communist order that is to succeed capitalism's. Markets may have been destroyed. They have yet to be replaced. Marx's view of capitalism and his vision of the future are flawed. In China today, there are the market-oriented reforms of Deng Xiaoping. It's very interesting that they're reverting to markets. Now in Russia, there's Gorbachev's Paris strike, I think. Paris, which is fascinating, it just has just come out. And I would argue that Marxists are starting to comprehend the problems of Marxism. That's where we're at today. Done. Yeah. Any other questions? Or? Yes. How do you deal with the um, commodity prices that are being used to subvert the third world? No, that's not in this. Can't deal with that tonight. Anybody else? These uh, com the, the current so-called communist countries have, have they actually abandoned all hope of moving towards com uh, Marxist ideas? There's or incredible they? depression in the Soviet Union right now about it. I mean, this what Gorbachev is doing now is critiquing Lenin, which is quite incredible. It's the first time they've critiqued the Godfather of the system, and they are talking now about putting markets in place within the system. Now, my guess is to tie it in with this last section is what Gorbachev wants to do is to create enough capitalism to create information that they need to make the system work to stay in power. 
I don't think they're interested in going to a free enterprise system. They want to have a controlled market economy where those market prices and profits and interests will be used so that they can efficiently run the economy as, as, as statists. You know, so they want to have their cake and eat it too. The problem is once you liberalize an economy, then you start creating feelings of individualism and bourgeois desires and people like to have a little piece of property and they want to have a TV and stuff and they start fighting the state. So this is what I see going on right now. It's, in China, they, from what I've read, is a, there's a big struggle now, but in China, they are heavily abandoning abandoning Marxism and socialism and moving right on to private markets. They even have a stock exchange now in Shanghai. They have checking accounts. Um, there's 25,000 plus Chinese students studying in the United States. A lot of them studying capitalism. I've taught many of them that are very pro-capitalism. This book, at the, uh, Human Action, is read at the University of Peking. It's quite popular. There's an old professor there who studied under Schumpeter at Harvard that's teaching this stuff. China's moving quite a bit further. But one of the reasons for that is China never did collectivize as much as Russia did. China, Russia, China is so massive that they never did figure out the whole system. Um, but I see Tanzania is moving. There's a lot of the socialist states in this continent are moving towards capitalism. And I see what well, basically we're seeing is that the Marxists are realizing that Marxism is, doesn't work. Now, how to still keep power? That's the problem of any political group, whatever the persuasion is. They want to keep power and keep the economy going. No. You'd have to advocate power. So he wants to have a controlled market. So it's just all I all I think is all these countries are just using capitalism in a dictatorial manner, in a state-controlled capitalist system. They aren't really socialist. And so the real question is, the real issue is, how do you fight back that state? Whether that state is here, there, or everywhere, to allow a market economy to emerge. Similar to, similar to reform of apartheid, you won't go so far as to advocate power. You've got the reform it to a point yeah, that you similar to that's, that's how politicians are. You know? That's how they it makes sense. Francis? Is Lenin no Marx? No. Never met Not as far as I know. You just studied his work. Yeah, as far as I know, I don't think they met. Shall we quit? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Mm. I'd just like to say all this pre pre supposes that we are on an up and up all the time in our uh, current resources. Uh, along the world in the 19 uh, in South Africa in the, in the 1990s, I submit that it is assuming that by high tech we can control nature, which I also submit is I'd like to hear your lecture series. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> see you. Thanks very much. Thank you very I much. Nice yeah. meeting you. Yeah. Well. Hope we get to see you again. Yeah. Hope this works out.